better stand. Understanding medicine. I am Professor Azizur Rahman, and today we are going to start a series of lectures on respiratory diseases. I just thought that the first thing we should talk about is dyspnea because that is usually the cardinal presenting symptom. Uh, it is usually an emergency. A uh, patient may be already a known case of respiratory disease or this may be the first symptom. Many times dyspnea could also come from heart diseases or other diseases. So I believe that every physician, every internist, every house physician, medical officer should be well equipped with this knowledge and skill to come up with this diagnosis of dyspnea and be able to differentiate between various causes. At least he should have or she should have some idea whether patient has got respiratory disease or cardiac disease because initial management is practically the same whatever respiratory disorder or whatever cardiac disorder patient may have. Of course, one then has to know exact etiology so that proper diagnosis and treatment may be offered. So this lecture, which is relatively brief, this would offer an approach to dyspnea. Various respiratory disorders and cardiac disorders will be discussed in separate lectures. Some details of the investigation which I am going to mention here will also be discussed in separate lectures. What is dyspnea? It is a, an abnormal feeling of awareness of breathing. It is an ab abnormal awareness of breathing. Normally when we breathe, it is effortless thing and we don't even know whether we are breathing. Of course, it is under our voluntary control. We can at least temporarily hold breathing. We can make it fast temporarily, but at least breathing is actually controlled by uh, an autonomic system and an autonomous center in the brain, uh, which is present in the medulla oblongata and the lower brain stem. So, what is the, what is the definition of dyspnea? Abnormally uncomfortable awareness of breathing. Some terminology because there are various types of dyspneas and there are certain terminology which we use. So I think it is best if we make ourselves familiar with this terminology. First thing is exertional dyspnea. I think one can easily figure out that this is the dyspnea which comes on exertion. It is possible that dyspnea is present at resting condition also. Only during exertion it becomes more worse. But it many times dyspnea comes only during exertion. Of course, it implies that the, the level of exertion we are talking about is a level at which patient used to feel normal. So that is exertional dyspnea. Most cardiac disorders and most lung diseases and anemia would cause exertional dyspnea before it causes other types of dyspneas. Orthopnea means when patient is asymptomatic, a patient does not have this feeling of dyspnea, only when patient lies flat on the bed back on the bed so only that time patient feels dyspneic. This is orthopnea. This is highly suggestive of left ventricular failure because in upright position large amount of blood is kept in the peripheral veins and there is less venous return. So there is less venous return and less uh, cardiac output. So even a, if the heart is diseased patient may not have this uh, heart failure symptom in upright position. The moment patient lies flat because the effect of gravity is eliminated, the venous return increases. In a normal healthy heart, this increase in venous return should not cause any problem at all because our heart is capable of pumping about four or five times the blood of the basal cardiac output. But if left heart is already failed and is already compensating, so this little increase in venous turn can push the patient into left ventricular failure or can aggravate left ventricular failure, can increase pulmonary congestion, can increase, can reduce oxygenation, 
and can precipitate symptoms of uh, uh, orthopnea, dyspnea. A similar condition is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Now, if you analyze this word, I'm sure you can figure out paroxysmal is something which comes in attack, nocturnal something happening at night, or dyspnea is dyspnea. So typically, patient lies down, patient goes to sleep without any symptom. Later during the night, sometime maybe depending upon the severity of the disease, maybe a few hours or maybe several hours later, patient suddenly wakes up this with feeling of dyspnea. Now, patient wakes up due to this feeling of dyspnea and typically patient would sit up and might open the window and after a few minutes, patient gets significant relief if not complete relief. Now, if that is the description, we call it paroxysmal, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. This is also highly suggestive of heart failure. The only difference between these two is this is more advanced. The moment patient lies flat, patient feels dyspneic and this is sometime later. The effect is the same. Although in this, there is some additional component. That means when patient lies flat for several hours, then edema, which is formed during the day because of venous congestion in the legs, that edema is absorbed. Effect of gravity is eliminated. This, this edema is absorbed and that also contributes to increased venous return. So both are highly suggestive of heart failure. How do we know if patient has orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea? You need to listen to the patient. Allow patient to tell the details of dyspnea, then patient will give you the typical history. In some respiratory diseases, patient may also uh, feel the dyspnea may be aggravated in lying position, but mostly these two symptoms are suggestive of left heart failure. Platypnea dyspnea in upright position, this is less common in some cases of diaphragm paralysis, this symptom might be uh, there. Then trepipnea, I think this is important, a symptom and etiology is when somebody, and what is trepipnea is dyspnea in a lateral decupitus position. Now this would occur if somebody has one-sided advanced lung disease, usually pleural fusion, also other lung diseases. If one side of the lung one lung, right or left, is almost completely damaged. Patient is ventilating through the other lung. So when we lie flat in a normal healthy person, although the lung on which we lie down, for example, on the right side, if we lie right uh, side, the right lung would definitely be affected. It would not expand to that extent as it does not in a normal situation. But that reduction in lung expansion does not cause dyspnea if your underlying lungs are normal. But if somebody has a diseased lung, one side is diseased, the only ventilating lung is the other one. Now, if you, if you, the patient lies on the healthy lung, patient is likely to feel dyspneic more than if patient lies on the diseased lung because the diseased lung is not ventilating already. So if patient, it is, if its expansion is further uh, hampered by lying on their lung, so that should not cause any problem. Now, pathophysiology of dyspnea, uh, you know, although we can temporarily hold our ventilation and we can also temporarily make it fast, but breathing is basically uh, done by naturally without we getting conscious about it because we breathe during our sleep also. So there's the respiratory center which is in the brain stem and the medulla oblongata. This would send signals to the respiratory muscles and the diaphragm through phrenic nerves and through the intercostal nerves. So these nerves would cause diaphragm muscle and the respiratory muscle to contract and this would lead to expansion of the lung, expansion of the chest cage. And because of that, there would be negative pressure in the lungs and that would suck air from the atmosphere and that would cause inspiration. 
and after some time then the, the signals no signals come from the respiratory because inspiration is complete then because of the elastic recoil of the ribs and muscles uh, the lungs they then the air moves out and that is expiration now this is actually this how much contraction is needed how many signal from the respiratory centers are needed this is controlled by the feedbacks going from the spindle to the respiratory center now this system makes sure that this much expansion was intended how much extension uh, expansion sufficient to keep oxygen and carbon dioxide with a normal physiological range so if that much expansion occurs so this would give the feedback signal to the respiratory center this is how our respiratory rate and the tidal volume is regulated uh, 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 assuming that the lungs are normal so these efferent signals and efferent signals uh, i'm not sure how to pronounce these words this is efferent this is efferent so these signals coming from the respiratory center to the muscles and going back they should equal and and they should also be able to keep our oxygen level and carbon dioxide level within normal range now we will have a separate lecture on blood gases but here oxygen is close to 100 mm of mercury uh, something like 95 or above mm of mercury and carbon dioxide is less than 40 mm of mercury so that is normal if that is abnormal range so we call it respiratory failure there could be mismatch this is normal healthy state but in some condition there could be mismatch if one has there is increased uh, work of breathing this could be due to one of the several reasons due, due to bronchospasm because of presence of perfusion various diseases they come under the heading of obstructive airway diseases or restrictive airway diseases so because of that our brain finds out that the level of expansion is not equal to what was intended so there is the mismatch between afferent and efferent uh, signals and that might result into this feeling of dyspnea so this would result in hypoxia and in some cases hypercapnia there are two types of respiratory failures as i said we will have separate lecture on that but here hypoxia is reduction in oxygen level uh, and hypercapnia is accumulation of carbon dioxide since our lungs are much more efficient to remove carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is more permeable or more diffusible than oxygen so it there may be possible that somebody just has hypoxia not hypercapnia and on this basis we classify uh, uh, respiratory failures so basically this mismatch of efferent and efferent signals that tells our brain the feeling of dyspnea and tells our respiratory center to work harder to make expansion more efficient so that hypoxia is corrected and hypercapnia is corrected etiology i think uh, in the emergency if you can figure out the what is the broad category of etiology i think that would be good enough the, the two main categories one is cardiac left ventricular failure and there are number of causes of left ventricular failure maybe simply hypertension or maybe ischemic heart disease cardiomyopathy many other condition so left ventricular failure or mitral valve stenosis so that would actually cause pulmonary congestion uh, by definition if there is tight mitral stenosis the left ventricle is not failing but there is pulmonary congestion so i think i have listed these two uh, conditions separately in both of them there is increased pulmonary venous congestion that leads to interstitial edema alveolar edema and i think we will have a separate lecture i think i have already recorded a lecture on heart failure so you can refer to that one if you're interested to know more about cardiac failure in respiratory diseases i think any lung disease if it is advanced if it is fairly advanced can cause dyspnea because the primary function of lung is to provide oxygen to the body 
and to remove carbon dioxide and you just learned that dyspnea comes due to accumulation of carbon dioxide and when there is not enough oxygen so any lung disease whether it is obstructive airway disease or a restrictive airway disease if it is advanced enough it would cause feeling of dyspnea but two main critical causes i think it is asthma and chronic obstructive airway disease but there are many other condition which can cause dyspnea so these are two primary etiologies of dyspnea but there are some other hysterical hysterical is uh, typically seen in young patients and usually a young girl it is actually a self induced hyperventilation and this is usually due to uh, attention seeking behaviors i think any experienced physician can immediately tell if this is hysterical or actual problem so we'll have some discussion on this also then anemia patient is grossly anemic there is feeling of dyspnea and then uh, deconditionings deconditioning means the patient is simply not used to do exercises so this is typically seen in women overweight women with underlying muscle and joint disease they have dyspnea uh, because they're not used to do exertion but there may not be any lung disease or heart disease then others what is meant by others there are some conditions which may cause hyperventilation but they're not traditionally classified as dyspnea for example patient due to a patient with metabolic acidosis diabetic ketoacidosis or renal failure when you have a look on them you will see that they are hyperventilating they are breathing fast and deep but that is usually not dyspnea because overall condition is dominated by other symptoms so that is usually not classified as dyspnea so i am not going to discuss that in further detail here initial approach i think it is usually an emergency and you need to have the skill to be able to come up with a diagnosis main diagnosis at least right so i think very important now one question which we always ask ourselves in this situation is if it is cardiac or pulmonary disease so we assume that we have ruled out other possibilities so if we have also ruled out hysterical it could be cardiac or it could be pulmonary now the catch here is patient may have a known pulmonary disease but has recently developed some cardiac etiology so actually co presenting cause may be cardiac now patient may have a cardiac disease but just immediately before coming may patient might have developed some pulmonary disease like pneumothorax so i think this question is may not be easy but most physician should be able to figure out if it is cardiac or pulmonary disease now to make things more complicated both these condition can coexist somebody with chronic obstructive airway disease could also have heart disease or there is usually combination for example patient with advanced pulmonary hypertension would develop right heart failure so there may be combination of physical finding it may not be easy but i think in most cases we are able why it is important because pulmonary diseases especially the obstructive airway diseases whether it is bronchial asthma or copd would respond to the initial treatment which is usually bronchodilator cardiac failure whether due to hypertension or ischemic heart disease or cardiomyopathy would respond to initial treatment which is usually a diuretic and offloading agents so i think that is important but of course we need to know the exact etiology so that the proper treatment is uh, can be given there are some important points in history uh, i would be emphasizing those points which will help you to differentiate between respiratory and cardiac causes duration of dyspnea uh, very important 
if somebody is like for example having history of dyspnea since childhood that would give you a diagnosis of asthma specific patterns of dyspnea just i mentioned orthopnea platypnea and uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and if we can see that patient is actually using accessory muscles for ventilation so all these patterns can help you to make a diagnosis in heart failure patient typically has frequent but short uh, uh, breaths severity of dyspnea uh, somebody having just exertional dyspnea would probably require a different kind of approach then another person who has dyspnea at rest then known heart or lung disease uh, of course this would be helpful if somebody is already known case of asthma and you have received him an acute attack of dyspnea so i think the chances are this is also acute i mean pulmonary cause of course sometime uh, other condition may also develop but mostly if somebody has a known disease i think our differential diagnosis would be affected uh, or is will be accordingly built smoking uh, of course smoking is important from a lung diseases point of view and also from cardiac point of view then family history uh, very helpful in asthma uh, then occupation there are some occupations which predispose to certain lung diseases pneumoconiosis there will be a separate lecture on that physical examination is also very important i think you need to examine patient uh, quickly and particularly general physical examination respiratory system and cardiovascular system you need to examine and the examination should be tailor made uh, of course you can skip certain things and focus on other things to be able to make a quick diagnosis Uh, in the interview of course this is history but when you are interviewing a patient when you're taking history you're also examining him now if patient has difficulty completing his sentences if he has to break his sentence several time so that gives you an important information or you could listen a wheeze when patient is uh, talking to you you can actually listen a wheeze so that would also give you a clue to the diagnosis then cyanosis you should examine the patient frank cyanosis may be obvious without even formal uh, inspection but uh, uh, you should examine hands you should also examine the lips you should examine that uh, tongue and the rest of the body so if there is cyanosis presence of blue discoloration that would tell us if it is uh, patient has cyanosis in both respiratory and cardiac disorders most likely patient will have central cyanosis that means cyanosis will be present in the central areas like lips and tongue and also the peripheral areas like hands and the ear lobules uh, but in cardiac failure there could be peripheral cyanosis also in peripheral cyanosis extremities are likely to be cold whereas in central cyanosis extremities are warm breathing patterns uh, various type of breathing patterns uh, can be recognized as somebody who is sitting up with arms supported on the ch uh, chair uh, arms and you can see that expiration is longer than inspiration and you can see pursing of lips you can see active accessory respiratory muscles like this steno mastoid muscle and also the intercostal muscle the intercostal spaces are prominent the the supraclavicular fossae becomes withdrawn with each inspiration and this typically will tell you that the patient has got severe attack of asthma in heart failure patient would have engorged neck veins patient may have also patient would prefer to sit up and there may be edema of feet then we will cite it so i think these breathing patterns there are many others also so they would give you a clue to the diagnosis accessory respiratory muscle i have already emphasized and shape of the chest now this is very important because in chronic obstructive airway disease particularly emphysema chest is fixed in a constant state of expiration so ap diameter antero posterior diameter is increased if you examine the chest Uh, you expose the chest and examine it carefully 
I think you can immediately figure out if there is a barrel shaped chest. If AP diameter is increased, that is called barrel shaped chest. So that is a sign of chronic obstructive airway disease, particularly emphysema. When you auscultate the chest, one thing which you are specifically looking for is the abnormal sound. If somebody has generalized ronchi present all over the lungs from bases to the apices on both sides, this is likely to be chronic obstructive airway disease or asthma. If somebody has bilateral basal fine crepitations, it is likely to be, likely to be left heart failure. Of course, Patient with a lung disease can have basal crepitation, but those crepitations are usually coarse and they are distributed quite extensively, not just restricted to bases. Of course, there may be a situation of pulmonary fibrosis where crepitations are heard only on the base. But ronchi are usually generalized in case of respiratory disorder. There are cases where ronchi may be restricted to one place if there is localized airway obstruction due to foreign body or due to tumor or mucus plug. Gallops and murmurs. Gallops is uh, you normally when you auscultate the heart we can easily appreciate first and second sound. If we can appreciate third and fourth sound also that would mean it is a gallop. It gives you the impression of a galloping horse. So if there is gallop that would suggest uh, a left heart failure. Murmurs may be due to lung disease, but mostly murmurs would suggest a primary heart disorder. Murmur of aortic stenosis, murmur of aortic regurgitation, murmur of mitral regurgitation, murmur of mitral stenosis, all have characteristic fact features. I think you can figure out the underlying etiology. And neck vein and liver and neck veins may be engorged in both lung diseases as well as in heart failure uh, because engorged neck veins is actually a sign of right heart failure which can occur in both diseases. And liver may be enlarged, may be engorged, may be tender and there may be ascites and there may be pedal edema also. So let's now briefly talk about cardiac dyspnea. Salient features Patient may be already a known case of cardiac disease, there may be orthopnea, there may be paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, presence of basal crepitation and gallops and murmur. This is actually the summary of what we already discussed. There is assessment of severity. You may have various grades or various classes of dyspnea. Uh, class 1 is more than ordinary physical activity causes dyspnea and class 4 is dyspnea at rest. And there are two more classes. If there is uh, an ordinary uh, uh, physical exertion results in dyspnea, that is class two. Ordinary mean ordinary for that particular person. Some activity that patient was uh, accustomed to do, and there was no dyspnea. Uh, the minimal like high household activity. If that also precipitated dyspnea, that would be class two. But if it is less than ordinary, like just getting up from the bed and going to the attached bathroom that would be class 3. Now what is the importance? The importance is to determine the prognosis. Obviously patient having class 4 dyspnea has got much worse prognosis than somebody having class 1. The other importance is that when we are treating these patients, if patient's class is improving, 4 is becoming 3, 3 is getting down to 2, that obviously means that patient is responding to the treatment. In investigation, the investigation of choice in patient with dyspnea is X-ray. Why X-ray? Because this gives us the information both regarding heart as well as lungs. And X-ray chest is readily available. So in all setup it is really available. I think after history and physical examination, you should try to get an X-ray. X-ray is best done in the X-ray department when patient is sitting up, but emergency X-ray can be obtained on the bedside also. So from the XHS, you would have a reasonable idea. For example, presence of cardiomegaly, pulmonary infiltrate, pleural effusion, pulmonary, uh, systemic embolism, pulmonary thromboembolism. 
pneumothorax. All these conditions can be very easily diagnosed on X-ray. Now, just to remind you, I have a series of lectures called uh, Radiology for Internists. All these conditions are covered in those lectures. So, if somebody is interested, I think he she can refer to those uh, lectures. Just briefly, this is cardiomegaly. You can see uh, the heart size is bigger than normal. Uh, and normally, the maximum transverse diameter of the heart should be less than half of the maximum internal thoracic diameter. In this case, it is definitely more. So it is cardiomegaly, indicating cardiac failure. You might not be able to tell if it is left heart failure or right heart failure or by biventricular failure or even pericardial effusion, but it would definitely indicate that heart is affected. This is pulmonary edema. You can see the heart size is almost normal, but you can see these pulmonary infiltrates. This is another case of massive cardiomegaly. You can see another case of massive cardiomegaly. So these patients are easy to recognize. Further investigation, if you have figured out that this patient has got heart problem, although the scope of this lecture is the initial evaluation, but further investigation may be needed, echocardiography. And on echocardiography, you can, this is a very simple test, can be done on a bedside or patient can be moved to the uh, cardiology department. It's a simple non-invasive test, can be done on bedside. Most valvular and congenital heart diseases can be diagnosed accurately on echo and reliably differentiate between cardiac and respiratory causes. Cardiac tamponade can be easily diagnosed and can be managed and left ventricular stroke, volume, ejection fraction and cardiac output can be determined. ECG is another useful test. On ECG, you may not be able to diagnose heart failure, but you could determine the cause of heart failure like for example acute myocardial infarction left ventricular hypertrophy valvular heart diseases or corpus nail you would have some indicators of these conditions i cannot discuss uh, in th them in detail because i have restricted my talk to the initial approach so further investigation uh, angiography may be needed in some cases uh, it would, of course, be very, very helpful in those who have coronary artery disease. Now, second uh, part of our talk is pulmonary dyspnea. Uh, any lung disease, if, it's, if it is sufficiently advanced, advanced can cause uh, dyspnea. These are the examples, bronchial asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, pleural fusion, pneumothorax. So once you have figured out that this is respiratory cause, you would have to differentiate between these based on various findings. Salient features of pulmonary dyspnea are history of cough, expectoration, especially this expectoration. If patient is expectorating thick sputum, which is yellow or green or blood tinge, that would be suggestive of an underlying lung disease. In heart disease, there is either no expectoration or it is frothy sputum. And if you can hear the V's also, that would be very suggestive of a lung disease. Accessory disparity muscles may be active and you can immediately figure out and identify them. Barrel shaped chest is very suggestive of emphysema and ronchi generalized ronchi and coarse crepitation is suggestive of pulmonary fibrosis and also COPD. So this is actually revision of what we have already discussed. And absent or reduced air entry suggests pneumothorax, pleural fusion or atelectasis. COPD and asthma, they affect both lungs. But these are the diseases which can affect one lung also. So one side may be normal, only on one side there may be a lung which is not participating in breathing and there may be absence or reduction in the intensity of the sound on that side. These are the some of the conditions which you can diagnose on X-ray like pneumothorax, pleural fusion, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, pulmonary fibrosis. 
nematodes. Just I'm trying to make a point that XHS will help you to differentiate between various pulmonary diseases. So just a few examples. This is of course pleural effusion. You can see there is an opacity on the right side which is uniform. Uh, you do not see the, the cardiophrenic and costophrenic. This is cardiophrenic. This is costophrenic angle. These are obliterated. Diaphragm is not seen. There is a classical a curvilinear upper border, a right side of the heart is also not clearly visible. So all these features of, are those of pleural effusion. The left side is normal. So this is likely to be a lung disease rather than heart disease. This is classical emphysema. You have increased vertical dimension. There is increased pulmonary fibrosis. The, the diaphragms are flat and low set. And you can see this little emphysematous bully also in some fibrosis. Now, just to remind you again that I have a set separate lecture series on uh, radiology for internist. So you can find much more variety of x-ray and much more uh, detailed description of these x-rays there. Further investigation lung diseases, you might need pulmonary function tests. Pulmonary function tests actually do not give you the exact diagnosis, but they're still useful. I would have separate lecture on this also. In pulmonary function tests, you can differentiate between an obstructive airway disease and a restrictive airway disease. And also you would have the quantitative evaluation. So you would know how much is obstruction and how much is the restriction. And you can follow that up. And later on, you can uh, see if patient is improving or otherwise. Paracentesis, if there is pleural fusion, you might like to take this fluid out and do further analysis. HRCT of the chest is very useful test. This is high resolution CT, especially in interstitial lung disease. This is very useful. Bronchoscopy may be needed if you are suspecting something in bronchi like bronch bronchogenic carcinoma. So the and the blood gases, I forgot to mention here, blood gases may also be very useful. So I think all these investigations are very very useful and hyperventilation syndrome is a hysterical problem and just few words on this a common condition especially in young girls because this is attention behaving uh, and attention seeking behaviors symptoms are out of proportion to the physical finding there may not be any physical finding especially in the lungs on auscultation there is no physical finding. There may not be any, uh, there will be no cyanosis. But please note down this hyperventilation itself can cause bronchospasm. So you have to see if the bronchospasm is sufficient to explain the symptomology. I think experienced physician will have no difficulty differentiating between the two. Of course, if there is a doubt that you would first consider physical condition then labeling this patient as case of hyperventilation. Patient describes more difficulty in inspiration. In COPD, in an asthma, we have more difficulty during expiration. Chest is usually clear and there may be carpopedal spasm. When we hyperventilate, we wash out our carbon dioxide and that may cause this precipitation of hypocalcemia and patient may develop a spasm which is like uh, this one carpopedal spasm and that is an indication of respiratory alkalosis. And when we do investigation in patient with hyperventilation, of course, we do some tests. It is not right not to do any tests. I think uh, you may be sure, but I think it would be right to do some tests. Like for patient assurance, you might like to do XHS or ECG or some blood tests and all are expected to be normal. And this may not be an easy condition to handle. Hyperventilation syndrome uh, is a hysterical illness. So you need to have a different type of approach. But of course, this also needs very, very careful handling. So thank you very much. This was Professor Azizur Rahman from Medistan. This was a lecture on initial evaluation of dyspnea, emphasizing on the fact that there are three main causes, respiratory, cardiac and hysterical physician or internist needs to be skilled with this 
uh, uh, approach to find out if patient has got lung disease or cardiac diseases or hysterical because initial treatment can be offered uh, correctly because this dyspnea is usually an emergency. So with that, I'd like to conclude and I will definitely present more videos on various types, various conditions like asthma, COPD and other diseases. So stay tuned and attend other videos also. Thank you very much. Professor Azizur Rahman from Medistan, Understanding Medicine.